podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Thank you for listening. If you are joining us on ACEC's YouTube channel, thanks for watching as well. My name is Diana Alexander, and I'm the Director of Private Market Resources at ACEC National. And today we're going to interview industry expert Jay Bowman with FMI, who will provide his market insights and uh, forecasted trends that are impacting our industry. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Jay before we welcome him on. Uh, He is a partner with FMI and uh, part of FMI's strategy practice in particular. And he advises clients on a range of strategic decisions, including business diversity, diversification, market entry, and competitive positioning. He also co-authors FMI's annual USN Canada Markets Construction Overview, similar to what we are going to take a look at today. Uh, He earned his MBA from East Carolina University and a BBA in Risk Management from the University of Georgia. And in 2020, he was named one of the 50 most influential people in construction by Autodesk. Jay enjoys spending time with his family, including his wife and three daughters, traveling, wing shooting, and SEC football. Uh, Jay, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, Diana. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have this conversation with you. Absolutely. So Jay and I met a few months ago. He uh, joined us in providing an economic outlook and market update at ACEC's Business Development and Marketing Forum, uh, which was in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, February and March of this year. And since FMI has actually released their latest North American Engineering and Construction Outlook for 2023. So we're going to get an update from Jay and I'm going to ask him a few questions about the report. Uh, And so let's dive in. So, you know, Jay, tell us a little more about FMI for those that may aren't familiar and what this latest report in engineering and construction outlook captures. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, So FMI, for those who may not be as familiar with our organization, we are a management consulting and investment banking firm, uh, but we work exclusively within the built environment. And so we use that term built environment because it encompasses not only architects, engineers, and and contractors, excuse me, but Also, think of all the material producers and building product manufacturers, uh, associations, anyone that kind of is within that area. And so part of what we do because of our focus on the built environment specifically is produce quarterly forecasts of construction spending uh, for the U.S. and Canada, basically as a service to our clients. And... We do track the 19 segments that the census uh, reports. So if you ever want to go look at our forecast versus what did the federal government say happened, uh, our track record is pretty good. We're usually within about 2% uh, on the forecast side, but it also helps people understand definitions. So when they say, well, what's included in healthcare? They can go look at the definition of healthcare from census and know exactly you know, what we're looking at. So. I've uh, been a part of the company, I said, for about 25 years or so, and this has been an area that's been near and dear to my heart um, and just really enjoy sharing with folks kind of not only what we're seeing, but what are the implications of those forecasts? Awesome. So I, I was looking through the report this past week and I, I pulled a comment from the opening summary uh, of the second quarter edition and uh, it stated this last year FMI altered base case assumptions for forecasts to include a multi-year recession spanning into 2023. Uh, as with historical cycles, impact on the construction industry will be longer lasting. Uh, so this of course is scary for all of us, especially in our industry. Uh, can you expand on this for our members and what this longer lasting impact may look like for our industry? Yeah, absolutely. And I I think there's, though, a few things that we have to keep in mind when we talk about recession and the impact of that. And But to back up and and answer your first question, I mean, we we believe that we are in a recession, that it started in 2022, uh, simply because we adhere to the more traditional definition of a recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, which we saw. Now, has this one been, excuse me, now has this recession been different than past ones? Absolutely. But every recession has its own characteristics that make it a little bit different than other ones. Uh, This does not appear to be like a great recession, but when we say we altered it, looking at what the Fed has decided to do from a uh, a monetary perspective, position and with the interest rates, 
it has become very evident that they are very willing to continue to raise rates, which is having a you know diff, more and more difficult uh, impact or, or negative impact on the overall market. And we can even look at more some of the more recent things, whether it was Silicon Valley Bank and others, have been a result of that. So that is that readjustment, if you will, showing that yes, this probably looks going to be you know more than maybe what was being expected. Uh, last year or so. Uh, however, that being said, the impact on construction for 2023 is somewhat minor because our industry typically lags the overall economy by about a year to two years. Right. So even though we had this you know, recession begin in 2022, we think that it sort of, I'll say, kind of hits its peak, if you will, uh, midpoint of 2023. We wouldn't really feel the effects of that until about a year or two later. So really 2024, 2025, before we'd see that at low point. Uh, so even for 2023, you're looking at total construction spending in the U.S., we just focus on that for now, being down about 1%. But that's total construction spending. So in 2022, it was roughly you know $1.8 trillion. So it's really kind of 1.8, 1.79. You know, that kind of range. For 2023, down 1% is still a $1.78 trillion market, right? So it's still a massive market. So that's why I mean that you know, I think we have to keep these things in kind of perspective. And just like a recession, it impacts different types of construction activity, different geographic markets very differently. And so we all can think of different places that right now we would say are uh, continue to do well uh, despite the overall uh, economy and overall construction market and other areas that you know are doing you know very poorly. So I think it's always important to keep that in mind that just like I shared uh, with the group in Scottsdale, this idea that bull markets and bear markets coexist at all times, and there will even be some segments and some markets that even though we may be in a recession overall, I would actually expect to see continued growth during that time period. That sounds more positive than what I first read. Uh, so I just want to point out for our listeners, um, you know, when Jay says, you know, construction put in place and we're looking at those CPIP numbers, um, for those not familiar, I just want to call out for our design engineers that those CPIP numbers do include design and construction spending. So we are looking at a full picture. It's not just construction. So th that's why this is important. And that's why we're looking at this data. Um, I, I wanted to focus a little more on a particular uh, market. Uh, tell me more about the single family residential and home improvement markets. The report reflects a steep decline in overall industry spending there. How long will the declines last and what else can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a that, that's that's probably the single largest impact on the forecast. So when I told you that our current forecast for 2023 suggests that total spending would be down by one percent, well, like I said, that you know nothing is really down one percent. Yes, the total you know construction spending is down one percent, but it's all these different segments as I mentioned. So single family homes, we are projecting about a 16% decline uh, in construction spending put in place in 2023 versus 2022. But when residential construction spending represents almost 50% of all construction, that has an outsized influence. So that's where that negative 1% is really kind of being impacted, if you will. In fact, outside of residential, Every single segment in our forecast is actually projected to be up in 2023. Total non-residential buildings up 10%. Total non-building uh, structures, think of that as heavy civil, up 6%. But for the reason why we're seeing single family homes dropping off is a combination of two things. One is just like we were talking about with the interest rates. You know, With the amount of increases we've seen now with uh, mortgage rates, and the impact of that, that does have a direct impact on you know, the decision for people to buy a home or to put off that purchase to maybe buy something smaller or whatever it may be. Secondarily, what we've seen is that increase in pricing has started to kind of slow. So we're not seeing that same type of price escalation, if you will, 
which has really allowed some people to essentially sell their homes at a very you know, large profit to be able to go buy another home. So maybe them staying put as well. So with that, it's just some of the broader things we've seen in the economy. Single family homes is typically one of those first areas to really get impacted. And we would probably say that you'll continue to see the slide in single family home construction until about 2025. That would be the low point before we see it to start to creep back up again in 2026 and then 2027. So conversely there, you stated non-residential and non-building structures are actually expected to be up uh, as opposed to the residential market, um, single family in particular. Uh, so what markets are actually going to see the largest rise and, and why is investment up there and how long will that last? And I also saw in your report that commercial actually takes a decline after a couple years as well, following the single family decline as well. So will we see other markets follow that same trend? Why are they up? How long will they be up? All right. So it's a great question. I think it's important to think about it in two ways. One is, you know, how does this year compare to last year? But then I think more importantly, and where I think a lot of people should really be thinking about is, well, what about the next five years, right? This year is somewhat in the bag for a lot of uh, people in our industry, you know, their projects already, you know, kind of sold and you know, on their way, like I said, it's a put in place forecast. But those that we would see strong growth this year, you know, those two strongest areas in the non-residential building, think of it as like vertical construction, would be lodging. Uh, so hotels, motels, which is actually up 16% this year. And then manufacturing, which is actually up a whopping 27% this year. Now, there's a little bit of things we have to think about in that regard. So up 16% lodging is great from a percentage standpoint, but it's not one of the larger segments, right? So it's somewhat smaller. So we're talking about, you know, roughly $21.5 billion, you know, US wide in 2023. Manufacturing, which is up 27% by comparison, you're talking about about $138 billion market. So multiple times larger than lodging. But the reason for that are somewhat different. So on the lodging side, that increase has largely been driven by you know, the pandemic, how that's waned and now service industries are back. People are traveling again, business travels back up, all that vacations. That's what's really driven that near term 16% increase, if you will. On the manufacturing side, a little bit of the same, but also a lot of the onshore and also just the investment in certain areas. So we say manufacturing, but manufacturing is made up of a lot of different sectors. So pharmaceuticals, biologics, uh, life sciences, you know, very strong from a manufacturing standpoint, what we're starting to see from an EV perspective. So that's had a real increase on the manufacturing side. You know, longer term lodging, we think would start to flatten out, you know, back to kind of a more of a normal routine. It's just coming up off of a really, you know, low, if you will. And while manufacturing, we think will continue to grow, you know, over the next couple of years, it'll probably start to take a hit in the later years. And it's not because manufacturing goes away or anything, but there's a strong push now to develop a lot of these new facilities and plants that then just becomes a capacity issue. You know, okay, we've built this capacity, then it just takes time to catch back up with it before we start another wave of building more manufacturing type facilities. So on the non-residential side, those would be the two biggest ones, but other gains we're seeing are in the commercial space. Again, commercial follows residential. So residential has been up you know, a lot over the last two years. Commercial kind of follows that. But as we've said, you know, commercial, excuse me, residential is starting to come back down you know, this year and next year. We'll start to see that impact the commercial market. So where the low point on the single family home side might be 2025, 2026 will probably be the low point on the commercial side. Uh, the other two areas, amusement and recreation, very similar to lodging. Again, with the service industries, you know, they've opened back up, people traveling, that's been a large part. And then transportation, which I know it's included in non-residential buildings. These are things like airports, uh, ports, rail, you know, mass transit, that sort of thing, up as well, and will continue to be up over the five-year period. But that's largely the result of what we've seen from federal funding, particularly from the IIJA, that's been a large part of that. So those would be the areas that we would see, I'd say, the strongest growth. Then in the non-building or the heavy civil side, you know, the real big gains are in highway and street. 
you know, up 10% this year, up 6% on a compendial growth rate over the next five years. Uh, water, wastewater, you know, both of those up about seven, nine percent and continuing around that range, maybe a tad off uh, over the next five years. And then conservation and development work, which is really uh, think of like environmental. So a lot of you know, things like dams and levees and other things related to uh, like brownfields and things like that. Uh, but overall, the, the non-building structures of heavy civil sector really just the benefit of the amount of funding that was made uh, through IJA. So it will be a it'll be a real growth period over the next five years uh, for that particular sector. Right. Everything that I have been reading lately uh, and in tracking the U.S. Census Bureau and, and numbers that ACEC looks at as well, um, we're, we're seeing the same. Uh, manufacturing boom uh, is something I'm going to publish in our next private side article. So it's very much real uh, and very much there. So uh, make sure you guys catch that and uh, read that soon. I did want to also ask you about another uh, indicator that you guys report on, which is the Non-Residential Construction Index, or NC. CRI. Uh, this portion of the report forecasted decline in engineering and construction opportunities ahead. Uh, what does this mean uh, for us and how long will that last? Right. So the non-residential construction index is, you know, very similar to how you might think of the ABI, right, for architects, but this one is for contractors. And it's just a sentiment index that just says, hey, you know, do you feel like the market is expanding or contracting? Any score over 50 would suggest that the market is in expansion. Anything below 50 would be in contraction. And so the contractors that we survey uh, for this, who participate in this survey, uh, the most recent rating or you know, score that we have was under 50. It's slightly better than it was the, the prior quarter, but it's just saying that, hey, you know, there's concern. You know, it's not way below 50. It's kind of right there, just, just below it. So I would call it, you know, kind of cautious, you know, concern about the marketplace, particularly when I've talked with contractors that are, are, are taking this because of the sentiment uh, survey. But I think it aligns overall what we see from a total construction spending. So again, that kind of down 1%. And it reflects a lot of what we're seeing in the news, and obviously with the Fed, you know, rate hikes, et cetera. But when you really start to talk to them, you know, a lot of these same contractors will tell you that, you know, well, we've got the biggest backlog we've ever had. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of work going on. Uh, but I think it's just that it's that concern about you know, where things are, and what's been talked about. And if that recession uh, were to, you know, uh, I say worsen or just how people are interpreting it for 2023, I think that's having more of that perception on the NRCI than necessarily reality that makes sense. Right. So I wanted to look a little more at the markets in particular that you laid out that will experience growth. And your report shows that average investment growth um, is expected to rise in particular in office, healthcare, amusement, recreation, sewage, waste disposal. You kind of touched on IIJA and the public spending there. But is there anything else that this increase in investment can be attributed to for these markets? And aside from the return to post-pandemic travel, traveling and lodging and amusement and recreation numbers. Yeah, I think the office one is, is a good example of this because, you know, all the talk of, well, we're going to start working from home and all the remote and people not being in every day. And while it has had an impact on office in general, we've actually seen an increase, for example, in class A office space, you know, amenities, those types of things. So there actually has been some growth. Don't think it's necessarily very long term, uh, but I do think that we continue to see uh, growth in that area. But the second part of that is really, well, what what do we mean when we say office construction? So currently, data center construction is actually included in office space, and data center construction spending has been, you know, probably the hottest growth segment next to multifamily construction spending over the last several years. And while there's some slowdown in terms of you know, the amount of data center construction near term because of cost escalations and things like that, it's still a very robust growth rate over the next couple of years. 
So that office number, that growth number is really sort of a combination of those two things. The increase in the class A space, which has a higher price tag to it, as well as that data center, which is really, I would say, the primary driver. Data centers right now about 20% of total office construction spending, but growing at double digit rates from now until 2027 easily. So that's one of those. Um, you mentioned on the uh, water wastewater side, you know, again, that's more of just a uh, the, the funding mechanisms in place from a federal perspective. But I also think it has to do with really more along the lines of where we've seen the population movement. So particularly the highest growth states like Arizona, uh, you look at Florida, Texas, even North Carolina and South Carolina now rounding out part of that top five is put a real stress on a lot of the water systems, particularly in what were, I'll say, prior uh, previous years, we would consider rural areas that now have become suburban areas. And when you start to bring in that many people and that much development, uh, you know, that has a real strain on the water wastewater side of things. So that's also been a large driver of the spending in that area. Very interesting. So I think we have time for one more question and I might be putting you on the spot. So if you're not the right person, uh, let me know who is and we'll have them on next time. Uh, I saw you guys had a new labor report come out and that I know is something that we are all interested in. Is there anything you know about that when we can expect to see it, what's included or who I should talk to? Well, actually the report was just released. I mean, within the last couple of days, and there's so much good information in there <clears throat> that I would recommend people go to our website. It's a free download, uh, but very, very uh, good information on just what we're seeing in the marketplace. And I would say, you know, while there's probably no change in the uh, fact that, you know, labor is still you know, the most difficult uh, challenge for nearly every organization, sort of like in other news, water is still wet. Uh, but I think what's fascinating is just the approach that people are taking to labor, you know, like well, what we thought we may have had before, meaning how much, you know, had to be learned prior to coming onto, you know, the, into the organization versus how much do we actually teach uh, within the organization, which has kind of opened up, if you will, a little bit of the number of different people we might be considering. Uh, but I would absolutely uh I, I, I would not do as much justice to uh, that report if I tried to tell you about it versus just going and, and downloading the full report. Great. Thanks, Jay. So uh, that is about all the time we have for today. But before we sign off, I did want to uh, mention a few other upcoming resources. The next private market industry brief will be released in May uh, with a focus on the healthcare and science and technology markets. I'll also return to interview two personnel from Collier's uh, to look at healthcare and life sciences more like we did today with Jay. So Jay, thank you for providing your market insight with us today. Thank you, Diane. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you, viewers or listeners, uh, for joining us on another Engineering Influence podcast from ACEC. See you next time. Mm -hmm.